Jana Maroney, our guest, she's a guidance counselor, she is a social justice advocate, she's a teacher, and one month into her marriage, her husband committed horrific, uh, violent crimes, and her life was forever changed and remains forever changed. A new life today, though, and we'll get to the happy part. Yeah. Uh, let's, the, the first time you saw him, uh, in the flesh, after the, after the mm -hmm. crime, mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, it was a few days after the crimes happened. I actually first I did see Jason in court when he was arraigned on the on the day uh, that I found out about the offenses, and I'll never forget seeing him walk into the courtroom um, wearing an orange jumpsuit. I felt like I was in some kind of a, a movie, mm. even if only that was was true. Mm -hmm. And he came into the courtroom, and he was completely absent in himself. You know, there, he didn't look at me or my parents uh, and it was I was so just was is the person that I knew still alive was he ever real who are you now and it was very overwhelming so one of the choices I made after a few days was to go to the jail to see him and to ask the questions that I had that I felt I deserved an answer to um, and to find out who he really was did your friends stick by you, abandon you, some abandon you, some not yeah. want anything to do with you, some blame you? Yeah, all of that. Mm. So I had many friendships uh, that became much closer, people who just were able to be compassionate, supportive, who reached out, whether it was bringing me a meal or lending me a car or really even coming to the jail with me, as you, you read in the book, mm -hmm. um, to other people who just wanted to distance themselves. Right. How dare you bring him into our lives? How dare you bring yes. him into our lives yeah. like you planned it? Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and it's what I reflect on now is how interesting it is that no one ever put the blame on the Parole Board of Canada, on Corrections Canada for having released him. Mm -hmm. They only blamed me for having trusted those those uh, systems and Jason. Yes. And I think there was an effort to distance themselves. You know, people, everyone wants mm -hmm. to feel safe after something horrible has happened, and uh, and some the way that some people choose to do that is to say, well, I'm not I'm not like her. I would have known, or I could have known that he was dangerous. Mm -hmm. So there's something wrong yes. with his wife. No, my and friend. That, um, uh, Anne Rule uh, was beside Ted Bundy, wrote the book about him, mm -hmm. The Stranger Beside Me. Mm -hmm. And she was a police officer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. eventually, yeah. and she had no idea. Right. A uh, heinous serial killer. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. and one of the there reasons. There, but by the grace of God. You know, well, I know yes, it sounds yeah. dramatic. No, but absolutely. And I, one of the reasons why I wanted to write my book was to stand up for the innocent. Um, family members who of, of offenders who mm -hmm. take the blame, who are left behind in the community. Something I realized about jail is that jails are important to keep us safe from people who are dangerous. Mm -hmm. But they also protect those same offenders who've committed harm from facing up to the consequences of their action and instead leaving behind in the community the family to, to face the mm -hmm. aftermath Mm -hmm. and the blame, and, and that uh, is a, one of the yes. realizations I talk about in the book about some of the mm -hmm. gaps or where we can improve our systems to hold the offenders to account and reach out to all people harmed by crime, victims of offenses, their families, the families of the offender. Exactly. Did you try to reach out to his victims initially? Initially, I asked about them at the police station and was uh, either told that they're with their families or in one case when I asked for help for myself from victim services was, mm -hmm. and I also asked about the women, was just told, you're on Jason's side, they don't need to hear from you. Uh, the identities of the victims were kept secret from me, uh, so I felt helpless. I, I would have done anything to help them, but I wasn't even allowed to mm -hmm. know who they were. And you could not go home to the crime scene because essentially your house was a crime scene, so that didn't work. When did you know you wanted to make peace, forgive, not mm -hmm. condone, uh, reach out to the victims, reach out to him. Or was I think, it a process? Uh, it was uh, it definitely a process. Um, you know, my immediate feelings following these crimes were of incredible heartbreak 
and sadness and confusion. They weren't anger and revenge and retribution um, immediately. You know, I certainly felt anger at different points, right. but um, I wanted to be able to have stopped what happened. I wanted to be able to help everyone, um, and I just couldn't do that. I was also the person, one of the people that needed help, and, uh, and that was very difficult to find. I'm sure post-traumatic stress for you yes. had to be lots yeah. of that or some of that, and regret and anger and remorse and yeah, all, all of the emotions you would go through. Yeah, all of those things. Um, I certainly never regretted any of my choices, my mm. regret is for Jason's choices. Right. And, uh, and uh, you know, I knew I, I would never blame myself mm -hmm. um, ever. Um, but uh, but just uh, just hel helplessness, and then really moved into a voicelessness. Right. To be able to. Do you still go to uh, where is he? Kingston. He's in the Kingston area. Okay. Kingston. Do you go to visit him still? Does your family go visit, or have you stopped that? Where is it now? Yeah, uh, Jason and I have now have very minimal contact. Uh, uh, a card on a birthday, you know, mm -hmm. that forgiveness process that I went through was very helpful, mainly for me, um, because I knew that I, it's not about forgiving what he did, but it was mm -hmm. about seeing the human being behind the yes. horror. And, um, and forgiveness for me opened up the possibility to gain my life back. I was mm -hmm. still such a young person. I wanted to have a family and have a full life and, and all the things I deserved. Sure. So I had to find a way to let go of resent, of anger, um, so that I could have the life that I deserved. Um, and so, so now uh, I wish for Jason that he would one day have some kind of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Will he be in prison for life? It's he will be, yeah. yes. Yeah, he will be, but... Uh, uh, the, the things that happen that don't even appear on the television in the crime shows, for instance, when uh, when he's convicted, then the, the officers give you all of the evidence. Uh, yeah, in after, bags because yeah. it's his stuff and mm -hmm. that must have been horrific. The returning of the evidence to me actually was a very positive experience, not in the way that you could mm -hmm. imagine. It was three years after, it was after the whole trial, the sentencing and all that. Um, and I was asked to go up to the police station and, and look at this evidence and then decide what to do with it. And um, the officer that met with me was extremely caring, mm. unbelievably sympathetic. We had a very good talk about what had happened. And then he, I said to him, well, you know, what are you going to do with all this stuff? And he said, we incinerate it. Yes. And that was honestly, I, the I, best. But it, it was, was the <laughs> duct tape he'd used. It's everything from the crime scene, right? Yeah. And then, but mm -hmm. worse was actually uh, on the, right after the actual crimes and the immediate aftermath, um, the police did what they could to clean up the, the mess in my home, but they're not allowed to actually remove certain things. So I had to call friends to come and clean up the, high, the, the, the crime scene in my own basement, remove right. a couch that was, but even. you know, it was, it was just, and those kind of things, you, you never think about it and it all falls to right. the people Well, what went behind. through your mind when you said, oh my gosh, the officer saw my messy kitchen. You know, what yeah. an aside, but it's so yeah. real. Yeah. It really is. Because when your home is searched, uh, you know, it, when I went back to my home, it felt as though there had been a break and enter. Yeah, it's such an the invasion. The police had gone through every single one of my photos. The officer, in fact, who first interviewed me at the station, it was a very hard interview. I think she herself was trying to get at who are you? Yeah, are you a Which Carla Homolka? Was exactly. there some part of you in this? Exactly. And, and then after her she job, searched, but yeah, and after she searched my home, she actually apologized to me. She said, "I'm very sorry. I mm. conjured up an idea of who you were, mm. and I was wrong because I went through your whole life, all of your photos I saw when you lived and worked and volunteered in South America and all this, and it was right. it was a very cold." Mm -hmm. 
comfort. And speeding ahead to now, you mm -hmm. still have a best friend, Rachel, who lives in yes. Colorado, yeah. and you happen to have a new husband. I do, I Who's do. a banker. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> with no criminal past. No, I certainly, it's not my, uh, I'd never gone out with anyone with a criminal past before, <laughs> and uh, so it's not a, not a pattern mm. no. um, at all. But no, I had the wonderful, great fortune after some practice dating, to mm -hmm. uh, but to meet a uh, wonderful man named Mike at a Valentine's Day party, and we were married on New Year's Eve. Congratulations! Thank and you. did he say something to you like, "Well, for all you've been through, you seem so normal"? Yeah, yeah. I thought mm. that was a great compliment because I worked so hard to recover mm. from those events to get my life back. That right. To think, good, you can't tell right away about the trauma that mm -hmm. I've lived through mm -hmm. or the victimization that I've endured. That was a big compliment. Well, the work you do is so powerful, the uh, restorative you. justice work. And I know you've teamed up with Katie Hutchison mm -hmm. and spoken to people. Katie Hutchison, whose husband, Bob McIntosh, was killed in Squamish. And yes. she made peace with his killer. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's very powerful. Thank you. Certainly not everybody could do it. So. You'll be speaking uh, today at noon, Surrey Campus, SFU, mm -hmm. and at 4 o'clock at the Burnaby Campus. Correct, yeah. And the book is called Through the Glass. Was it therapeutic for you in any way? I know to you always get book. asked that no, question. I, no, it, it's, uh, I'm happy to talk about writing. It's a different thing than, than telling the story. It was therapeutic. Uh, I like to say it's therapeutic like many therapies where you feel a lot worse before mm. you feel better. Right. So the first drafts were very hard, reliving everything and then it, uh, it got easier over mm -hmm. the time. And now to think of turning that V from a victimized from meaning uh, voiceless and violated to, have, to being vocal, to being vindicated and validated is mm -hmm. very, very gratifying. And I've already I've heard from people right across the country who have said thank you or thanks for mm -hmm. raising a voice about, uh, for mm -hmm. one another. So it's, it's a fantastic experience now. Yeah. Nice Thank to meet you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very it. much. Through the glass, uh, Shannon Maroney.